Good evening. Welcome you all to our seventh webinar. This is a part of a series of webinars, online symposia, online workshops organized by the Department of English, Jahanginagar University, Bangladesh. But today it is our privilege and honor to listen to Professor E. V. Ramakrishnan, who is advanced professor, a poet, a translator, a critic, a writer. And today he will talk about translation with focus on translator subjectivity, or we can say kind of intimacy. So it is in the recent years, uh, an element of translation that has gained currency is translator subjectivity. The history of translation studies has witnessed several metaphors that explain the relation and interaction between a text and a translator. So there are the metaphors of uh, master disciple or master slave, sometimes metaphors of conflict, couched in sexist language, conflict between fidelity and fertility, sometimes the metaphors of invasion and subordination, sometimes the reverse, cannibalization, sometimes masculine transduction or feminine transduction. What is important is to foreground the agency and the subjectivity of a translator, the protocol and the ethics that a translator maintains, the biases and the poetics of subversion that a translator deals with, and intimacy that a translator brings to their interaction with the source text, or referencing La Planche, the seductive source text. Intimacy is a key word of our today's webinar, which is to be offered by Professor E. B. Ramakrishnan. Now, I would like to request Dr. Rahim M. Sharif, Associate Professor of the Department of English, Jahanginagar University, to introduce the speaker and to moderate the speech session. Dr. Rahim Sharif. Thank you, Professor, uh, Professor Hussein. Uh, I'm privileged to um, introduce Professor E. V. Ramakrishnan. He's a bilingual writer who has published poetry, criticism, and translations in Malayalam and English. He was a faculty in the English department of V. Narmad South Gujarat University, Surat, from 1985 to 2010, um, and at the Central University of Gujarat, Gandhinagar, as professor and dean and professor emeritus from May 2010 to December 2019. He has received um, Kerala Shaita Academy Award in 1995, Vaikari Award in 2018, and Odakuzal Adakuz Award in 2018 for his books of literary criticism in Malayalam. He's a recipient of several fel fellowships and including Fulbright Fellowship and Shastri Indian Canadian Fellowship. He has been visiting professor to many foreign and Indian universities. Among his books in Malayalam are um, Akshar, Akshar, uh, Akshar, Akshar, Bu, sorry, uh, Aksharu, Aksharabum, sorry, yes, Aksharabum Adunik Tayum, published in 1994, uh, Deshya uh, Dagarum, Shaitabum, published in 2000, um, Ainu Vamle Arkan Pedi, published in 2008, and Malayar novel in uh, Malayal Loven in De Desha Kalangal, published in 2017. His notable critical books in English include Making It New, Modernism in Malayalam, Marathi, and Hindi Poetry in 1995, Locating Indian Literature, Texts, Traditions, Translations, published in 2011, and Indigenous Imaginaries, Literature, Modernity, Religion. He has four poetry volumes in English, the most recent one being Tips for Living in an Expanding Universe. So, this is his brief intro, uh, brief intro to EV, Professor E.V. Ramakrishnan. So um, I would like to invite Professor Ramakrishnan to um, start um, his talk. And, um, and I'm requesting audience, if you have any questions, uh, you can um, place them in the chat box. Uh, at the end of the session, we'll try to collect them uh, and share with our speaker. And if you want, you can uh, verbally share if you like you can do that as well so thank you thank you for you know showing up for this session so um, let's start professor Evie 
Ramakrishnan. Thank you. I hope uh, you can hear me. Uh, yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I feel greatly honored to be part of this webinar series being organized by the Department of English of Jahangir Nagar University. Professor Dr. Leizu Nasreen, uh, Chair, Department of English, Dr. Rehan Sharif, faculty member in the Department of English, Professor Mashru, Shahid Hussain, uh, the convener of the webinar series and a close friend of uh, many of us in CLI, members of the faculty, students of the department, and colleagues and friends who are part of this uh, program. Any discussion on the literatures of Indian subcontinent would invariably touch upon the question of translation sooner or later. We live in a multilingual zone of translation, which have been variously called Vivartana, Bhashanda, Paribhasha, Anuvad, or Anubada, Anukradi, Tarjuma, Bhashya, Tika, and so on. It's not my purpose, uh, objective in this presentation in, uh, to get into the contested issues of fidelity or freedom, literal versus literary, domesticating versus foreignizing, etc. Professor Mashru did mention the large number of uh, uh, binaries which uh, confront us the moment we address the question of translation. Uh, the larger context of uh, my presentation is uh, the need for developing translation studies in the subcontinent as a very important discipline. Uh, because translation is an essential interdisciplinary uh, area of uh, uh, scholarly engagement, not only in comparative literature, but culture studies, feminist studies, theater studies, film studies, and uh, many allied uh, uh, disciplines, it's important that we pay more attention to the emergent discipline of translation studies. Another context which I have in mind is as a, a student of Malayalam literature, my mother tongue, I feel the uh, volume of translations between Malayalam and English. This must be true of uh, many major languages in India, including Bengali, uh, from Bangladesh uh, as well, uh, the volume of translation has increased manifold in the last uh, two to three decades, and mostly into English. Uh, translations between Indian languages or between uh, languages uh, in the neighboring kind of uh, uh, subcontinental language, they are still not that frequent. And given this situation, we need to examine what exactly are these translations doing. For instance, uh, in Malayalam, I can very well see um, in the last uh, one decade, uh, many translations have won very important uh, uh, awards and prizes for example, uh, JZB uh, Fiction Prize has been won by two major uh, Malayali novelists. Crossword Award has been won by two major Malayali novelists. All these are into English. Are there translations which fulfill a certain cultural kind of uh, dynamics uh, in favor of the, uh, what you call, the source language, 
because one of the major problems when you translate into uh, English is it, it actually uh, has a hegemonic presence in uh, countries like India. So today I was reading a review of uh, a, a prize winning uh, uh, mustache is the name of a novel which won JCV prize uh, in the last uh, in the last month or maybe at the beginning of this month and it has been reviewed in a major newspaper and it takes uh, it's uh, not a very long review but it discusses the novel and then toward the end in one last sentence it mentions and this is obviously the manner in which uh, uh, most of the reviews look at translation. The last sentence is, though challenging, this novel, skillfully translated by Jayashri Kalatil, is a most rewarding read. But you see, the whole translated novel has been made available through the agency of translation, through the translator. Uh, shouldn't we uh, pay more attention to the process and uh, the product of translation? This is not happening. Maybe uh, there is a felt need to develop, and this is why uh, I would be actually examining what happens in the context of, because Malayalam is one uh, language I am uh, very closely, uh, as mother tongue, as my first language, closely uh, related to. So I'll be looking at the whole question of translation and translation studies in relation to Malayalam. My presentation will have three sections. Initially, I'll be examining certain concepts as derived from uh, Gayatri Swack and Walter Benjamin. Then I will pass on to uh, the question which uh, I want to examine in relation to a major novelist called Vaikam Muhammad Bashir in Malayalam, uh, whose novel, uh, Me Granddad Had an Elephant, is a novel I would like to discuss in some detail. And if time permits, I may also look at O.V. Vijayan's uh, uh, Legends of Kazakh, which is uh, a novel self-translated by him. Uh, the plurality of concerns, uh, which I actually want to uh, uh, which I, I actually invoked through some of these terms regarding translation, will not detail here, as we are concerned with some macro issues that have cultural as well as ethical implications. I choose to translate a text because it speaks to me in the present. It may have to it may, may have spoken to others differently in the past. What is the relation between time and translation? Tran translation marks, uh, according to Benjamin, a movement of the original's afterlife. The original inhabits a time which is prior to translation, but in its very nature of representation, Translation was inherent in the original. Benjamin uses the term translatability to signify an essential feature of certain works. It's not the content of the original that survives in translation, but a certain sense of purpose, the significance of the original. The life of the original attains in translation, according to Benjamin, ever renewed, latest, and most abundant flowering, unquote. Both the language of the original and that of translation do not remain static. They are in flux. Translations do not exist in a fixed time frame. What is relevant here is Benjamin's observation, and this is one of the key issues which I am uh, going to pursue. I quote, 
a specific significance inherent in the original text expresses itself in the translatability in a way uh, benjamin says uh, this specific uh, significance also makes text untranslatable so translatability and untranslatability are attributes of a certain basic feature of certain text and uh, the continuing life of great works uh, is what benjamin calls fame translations mark that stage of fame when the content of the original what they mean is no more central no more basic or relevant in translation we can trace i call the after ripening of the alien word here comes one of the most acute observations by benjamin on translation he points out that languages are interrelated in what in what they want to express languages complement each other in their intentions and then he adds to gain a precise understanding of this law it's necessary to distinguish within intention the intended object and the mode of its intention it's very important to actually understand the difference between the intended object and the mode of its intention uh, let me actually clarify this with an example uh, in one of his lectures uh, i heard on youtube by homi baba he actually mentions how north indian missionaries while translating the bible into hindi translated the holy ghost as bhoot and uh, and this had the effect of in a way scaring away the people they wanted to actually convert taken separately the word ghost and bhoot may complement each other they they actually uh, as discrete languages they are uh, having a kind of relation separately but as <coughs> uh, benjamin says the mode of intention in the original which has theological objectives obviously in the bible holy ghost comes in the context of a theological kind of uh, uh, context it is a larger epistemological context of the text and the word bhoot will not actually be appropriate so the mode of intention can very well in a way uh, distort the very uh, context or a content of a translation when i am going to discuss uh, this novel by uh, by kum mohammad bashir and that's the context i'll be explaining it later when a character uh, suddenly says ya rabul alamin with an exclamation mark this is the original in the malayalam novel the character says ya rabul alamin and asher dr asher who is professor of linguistics at uh, edinburgh university who translated and this was a unesco uh recommendation it's a volume in the unesco series so when he translates bashir's novel he translates this phrase as good god with an exclamation now that is where i i i feel the mode of intention can actually i either add or take away from the text a subtext may actually suddenly enter the text through the use of words words in a way permit certain things to come an entire discourse may enter without your knowledge and that's where i think uh, this uh, question need to be examined uh, in great uh, detail i will also there is a very interesting paper by aniket jabre 
on translation and its theories, some ideas and questions. Where he mentions uh, a Marathi translations of uh, uh, Marathi translation of Nietzsche's *The Antichrist*. In fact, it was done by a Brahmin from Pune in 1930, and this translation largely uses Nietzsche's text uh, in a way to endorse a certain. Aryan supremacy theory in the context of India. And this, uh, in fact, uh, in the introduction, uh, Rajwade actually says, A. Rajwade, he, he says, uh, uh, Nietzsche is a Mahamuni of Brahman Vritti. And Javare comments, there cannot be much doubt that what we have here is the Marathi appropriation of the Nazi Nietzsche. Nietzsche's condemnation of Christianity comes handy, as does the rhetoric of Chandal mentality. Look at the mode of intention operative in a translation. I'm giving these examples mainly to, to uh, bring home the idea that the larger uh, subtext will come into play only when the mode of intention in the translation becomes uh, aware of the subliminal voices within the text. How a, a certain, uh, if you are actually using Nietzsche to address an Indian audience to endorse a certain uh, ideological view of Aryan supremacy, it has consequences. So the more of, this is something which Nietzsche's original text, Nietzsche of course was writing as a versive text, but that was not, uh, the mode of intention was extremely different. And this is where uh, uh, the, the distinction between the intended object and the mode of intention of this object has to be kept in mind in discussion, evaluation, examination of translated text. And what Benjamin says is also a core in Gayatri's to access say, the politics of translation. And she shows how the rhetorical nature of language, she uses the three part right, kind of structure, rhetoric, logic, and silence, a, a language has a rhetoricity, a certain larger rhetorical feature which decides the nature of meaning. Of course, there is the logic. Now, I can very well say today uh, was rather cold. Now, definitely the meaning must be very clear. You can translate it. But in the larger context of the fictional mode you are actually translating, it can, maybe somebody who doesn't know English is using this sentence just to impress you that he or she knows English. Or maybe it's a code to mean something else. The mode of intention of the original can vary. In Gayatri Swag says, the rhetoricity can disrupt its logical systematicity. In an English translation of a non-European woman's text, I quote Gayatri Swag, the translator cannot engage with or cares insufficiently for the rhetoricity of the original. When Stanadaini is translated as the wet nurse, the politics of translation neutralizes the author's irony in constructing an uncanny word. And Swag comments, the theme of treating the breast as an organ of labor power as commodity, and the breast as metonymic part object, standing in for other as object, is lost even before you end of the story, when you use the word the wet nurse. She demonstrates how rhetoricity disrupts the social logic of meaning, uh, meaning creation with reference to the translation 
from a reputed 18th century singer poet of Bengal, uh, namely Rama Prasad. Uh, I will not go into, she herself translates. Uh, in fact, uh, this, this, and uh, then she actually compares. And one translation she uses is uh, the one done by a disciple of Vivekananda. Uh, whose uh, stilted kind of discourse doesn't actually allow the, the band, uh, you see the bhakta as a kind of a devotee uh, talking to goddess in a tone of band, uh, that actually is completely lost. So she does a translation to demonstrate how it's much more uh, colloquial and uh, and this is uh, the, the, and that's where she actually says uh, uh, some of the most intimate aspects of a language may remain unstated. Languages have a certain silence built into them. And in the act of reading, one may need to weave this silence into the, I quote, the details of personal life, the history of language, the history of the author's uh, movement, the history of the language in and as translation, etc., to listen to the subliminal voices, to the subtext that define the rhetoricity of the textual fabric. And uh, Stuart gives a translation of Ram Prasad's poem, uh, her own translation, again, the version made by the disciple of Vivekananda which she says is uh, the opaque exhibit providing evidence of the aligned fact of narcissism. And this is, uh, you see, very often translations from Indian languages into English are praised for their fluency. And the more fluent a uh, translation is, uh, the more invisible the translator becomes. Uh, Lawrence Venuti has a book called The Invisibility of the Translator. And uh, that's where uh, Gayatri Swag says there is something called translatees, a, a kind of idiom which uh, is actually in currency that makes the translation appear as the, the native kind of uh, uh, writing. And she says, in such translation, a woman in Palestine begin to resemble a man in Taiwan. So it is in this context, she says, translation is the most intimate act of reading. I surrender to the text when I translate. So intimate reading is not only a, a kind of close uh, intimacy with the text, but a larger preparation, scholastic and uh, what you call erudite kind of preparation, which require, which demands a, a certain involvement in the formation of the text itself. The text formation itself doesn't happen in the text, it precedes it. A whole lot of voices which enter the text come from the social, political, cultural, and many other uh, contexts, many other symbiotic kind of structures. And here, I would also like to uh, quote, there is Kwame Anthony Apaya, who, who uh, put forward a theory of thick translation. And uh, Apaya very aptly says, I quote, uh, you see, translation that aims to be of use in literary teaching, and here it seems to uh, me that such academic translation, translation that seeks with its annotations and its accompanying glosses to locate the text in rich cultural and linguistic context is eminently worth doing. There is a felt need to actually give a large, you see, I'm not saying a uh, translator has to be a great scholar, but there is uh, 
many of the translations from uh, i have in mind many of these recent translation from malayalam into english only one of them i i find a novel translated by welson thumpy sara joseph odap it has uh, a, a introduction it also has uh, a, a author's note this critical introduction goes a long way in placing the author and the text and there is uh, also an essay a small essay by paul sakaria another writer because odapu is a christian concept the many meanings of odapu he has written and then there is a long interview with the author you see these these apparatus which are extra literary which may not you see they need to be assembled to to actually uh, claim or recover the subtext the voices which may not uh, really uh, you see which may not uh, uh, is otherwise they may get suppressed in the act of translation into a hegemonic language translation must lovingly and in detail incorporate the original way of meaning so that translation as a fragment complements the original there is always something fragmentary and perhaps some of you know that famous uh, comparison uh, benjamin made you see you imagine a vessel uh, maybe like a flower vase it is broken you are joining and this is where the cultural translation in fact when you join when uh, the translation complements the original a third you need to use baba's kind of analogy a kind of third space a third dimension opens up and this is a dialogic site where the emist asymmetrical power relations of the two languages uh, negotiate meaning as an intercultural process translation <clears throat> never makes a complete and final meaning available it's a, a translation can always be overtaken by another translation another word has been translated seven or eight times into english it has sometimes been translated as a majoritarian text sometimes it has actually uh, given more importance more balanced kind of uh, you say uh, importance it has many strands you may take one and suppress the other and uh, i have uh, i don't know how many of you have seen this translation ananda math or the sacred brotherhood by uh, is a julius lipner i mentioned this because the text of the novel is 110 pages but the introduction is about 130 pages and this is an attempt to and then there are references and many other you see apart from introduction i'm not saying all translation should uh, aspire to this level of level of uh, thoroughness but in indian kind of context where invisibility of languages i'll give an example between bengali and malayalam i have certain uh, facts till 1975 there have been about 150 bengali novels etc translated into malayalam and the number of malayalam texts translated into bengali is less than 10 so the proportion will more or less be the same even today so between indian languages that's where i said this asymmetrical power relation in a way uh, creates invisibility and how do you negotiate that one translation stand alone with the authors and translators name it's not actually uh, enough in the indian kind of uh, uh, context now to come to uh, bashir's uh, uh, book you see if you look at uh, arya sher was <coughs> a professor of dravidian linguistics in edinburgh university and uh, great Uh, knowledgeable person about tamil malayalam also 
the original novel in malayalam appeared in 1951 and this translation by arya sher appeared in 1980 and uh, he was assisted in translation by achamma sri chandrashekharan though the nature of their collaboration is not very clear in the introduction he begins with a reference to the high literacy of kerala and its vibrant literary culture in fact when the novel endu poopakaran indarnu it's a kind of uh, oral idiom which uh, spoken in a dialect of malayalam and the literal translation would be, would be my grandfather had an elephant but to to make it sound like the original he says me granddad had an elephant so he is trying to make the title itself sound like an oral now in the introduction he makes certain kind of observations one is contemporary writers in kerala have a certain tendency to set their novels and short stories in the author's community this is not substantiated this is an observation which i don't think will be valid with reference to most of the authors though communities produce writers uh he goes on to say how bashir in is representative of this tendency and adds that his stories and novels with muslim settings have the most universal appeal and uh, uh, already this novel was in its 10th edition he had sold more than 1 lakh copies so what benjamin says fame it was already part of the text when he decided to translate it and then in the introduction he makes uh, a, a comment that uh, one reason for the selection of the text is the fact that uh, bashir has made a conscious attempt to produce an islamic literature in malayalam this is exactly what tells me that a lack of intimacy can lead to a misreading of the context of the novel uh, to say that bashir's novels or fiction has created and he he says bashir has made uh, certain comments in the recent auto reminiscences i've gone through those reminiscences which are rambling kind of uh, uh, conversations with uh, a, a group of journalists or literary uh, kind of <clears throat> enthusiasts and they they do not carry the stamp or the signature of bashir the creative writer and uh, we uh, bashir does speak of religion among other things but the bashir who comes through from the book uh, is the voice of a complex creative artist who is concerned for the human race plants animals transcend all such sectarian beliefs in fact uh, we will read uh, i will actually look at some of the uh, you say and here i would also mention two uh, or three points one is muslim uh, muslims in malabar or muslims in kerala we are not part of the mainstream literary tradition till the middle of uh, the 20th century they used arabic malayalam that is malayalam written in arabic language and this kept them out of the mainstream and bashir was aware of this larger uh, problematic where uh, we we uh, do not see the muslim way of life muslim norms of understanding the world it it's uh, uh, a, a certain kind of invisibility i will cite an incident bashir's first novel balyakal sahi childhood friend was being printed in ernakulam press so one day bashir went there to see the proof and to his horror he found that every conversation he had written in this novel in malayalam original uh, 
was corrected by the compositor or the proofreader whoever was the in the press and bashir he very humorously uh, described the situation he says i called all of them into the courtyard and those days he used to be a uh, says a revolutionary kind of he participated in a lot of rebellion and that is quit in the movement many even underground he was a follower of bhagat singh then he became all this so he is a i used to carry a dagger and i took the dagger in one hand and told them if you ever even correct change one letter in my manuscript that be the end of you say you are uh, job or not even life and he burns the entire printed copies there is lots of now this is a very important pointer to the way in which muslim uh, voice or muslim uh, what you call discourse was seen by the mainstream they were not only invisible they were not uh, admitted into the, the uh, and that's where now very briefly this novel me granddad had an elephant you see you have one family of uh, very rural muslims and the heroine the main character uh, kunyu patuma the little girl she is now uh, a young woman late in her you say life in the teenage maybe from 16 to 21 that's what actually is described her father was a uh, local Uh, most committee chairman and what uh, uh, an adima her mother uh, came from a very aristocratic family she keeps repeating the word my father had an elephant so she will keep telling kunju ma your grandfather had an elephant elephant again in kerala kind of uh, cultural uh, vocabulary carries the uh, semiotic um, you see content of aristocratic uh, lineage and uh, a, a certain uh, kind of uh, uh, display of wealth and grandeur all these are used by that's why i say the uh, novel addresses a larger kind of audience it in a way is addressing the emergent kerala kerala is still not a reality 1951 is writing it 1950 and the literacy of kerala at that point is i'm told 47 percent so kerala is still largely literate and muslim community may have little literacy even less than the average and uh, bashir was actually writing on a slate which was already written by the majoritarian writer or from other communities and the voice of the muslim was still to be heard so he is acutely aware of the symbolic power of language and the cultural capital produced by literary works bashir uh, has a kind of critical relation with the mainstream uh, malayalam uh, literary tradition and another thing is uh, at the same time he was uh, he had enough inwardness to this uh, muslim marginal culture subculture which gives the novel a very clear kind of uh, authenticity now looking at the original and uh, i also want to mention you see if uh, this novel in a way enacts the tensions or conflicts or contradictions involved in the linguistic organization of a novelistic narrative in fact uh, if we use the phrase from benjamin what's bend and the way of meaning is central to bashir the rhetoricity of his language is performative when i say well, the novel sure. performs it in a way performs this uh, rupture between uh, you see the language and experience the standard language and experience and this is where the subtext become extremely important the dialect the muslim dialect of malayalam becomes central 
And a third point I want to put before I look at some of the uh, original and translation is, Bashir is not talking about a monolithic Muslim identity. Uh, in a way, uh, he is well aware that Muslim community in Kerala functions more like a community. It's not a religious community. It may be more like the caste structure because we know they were largely traders in Malabar. And uh, Malabar had no trading caste. Just as Southern Kerala, the Christians were traders and there were no other trading caste. So you do find Muslims in Northern Kerala or even Middle Kerala have functioned largely as in the spectrum of Kerala social structure, more as a community with its own folklore, mythology, and a whole lot of but then this inwardness was not understood by large number of uh, Malayalis. So there is a complex poetic at the core of this uh, uh, folkloric kind of an Islam, which uh, is represented in the uh, novel. And I, I will actually, you see, uh, and this also, uh, this requires a kind of intimacy. This is where intimate reading becomes not reading the text alone. You have to need, uh, you have to, now look at uh, <clears throat> the very uh, opening first paragraph of the novel, Me, Granddad and an Elephant. In the original, there were 12 sentences. And in the translation, uh, Ari Asha, has left out seven sentences, seven sentences, only five sentences in the translation. I have roughly translated the original in my own language. Before that, I will read what Ari Asher has done, his translation. It is as if it happened thousands of years ago, for childhood is a long way off, is it not? Since then, many things happened. Kunju Patama can remember it all only as something pleasant. Laughter is much better than weeping. This is the opening paragraph in the translation. Now look at a literal translation of the original, done not with great... Uh, it, uh, she can remember all that only as something farcical raw life. There is this Malayalam sentence, Pacha Jividam, raw life. It's always an inexplicable mystery. Nothing is under the control of anyone. What can be done? One feels like weeping and also laughing with an open heart. Laughter is always better than weeping. See, there is a larger vision, a signature of uh, Bashir in invoking the inexplicable mystery of life. Actually, Kunyapatuma's uh, life changes. When father loses a legal case, he loses all his property. They become, they are reduced to living in a uh, rented house with bare minimum. And that's when they meet another family, another Muslim family, and they are middle-class uh, Muslims who are highly educated. And that family, uh, the father, Sainal Abidin, is a professor. And his son, Nisar Ahmad, is a young man. And Aisha is the sister. So look at two families. Elder I said, this is the rural uh, Muslim family deeply uh, implicated in the Orthodox tradition, believing in. And this is where the first part of the novel, largely, it invokes this uh, dynamics and uh, the, this uh, uh, semiotics of this uh, folkloric kind of an Islam, which in a way uh, works through the everyday life, it is a quotidian uh, 
which they, they inhabit. You see, there are several references. Uh, for example, uh, there is a reference to, uh, I, I am omitting many parts. I have about five minutes, so I will. Uh, so, for example, the evening sermon in the uh, mosque was. So, Kudupatuma's knowledge of Islam is largely, it comes from many of these uh, you see, kind of. Uh, but then, uh, you see, there are several references to the everyday world of this Muslim community. Uh, and there are footnotes. There are footnotes which uh, uh, he omits totally uh, in translation. Many things which uh, uh, invoke the everyday life of the rural Muslim community uh, which actually has uh, is a, uh, references to Islam. And sometimes when uh, he translates them, I have given an example at the very beginning. I, I will only deal with this. There is this first meeting between uh, Kunju Patama and Aisha, the liter uh, highly educated Aisha and illiterate. You see, this literacy of Kunju Patama is also problematic. Yeah, this is a student of mine when he did a PhD on this, he has argued. Kunju Patuma had gone to Madrasa. She knew Arabic Malayalam. She could read. There is a reference to how Tauba, Tauba is uh, actually read in the family. So this uh, question, and when Tauba is read, it has a kind of oral, this orality of the text in translation uh, a whole lot of morality suppressed by Asha. Particularly when this Toba is read, there are a lot of, uh, in the original, uh, it says Tetugal, misdeeds, mistakes. Please forgive us for our small mistakes done in the open, done in the, so it's a kind of sing song kind of prayer. And in translation, it becomes, oh, almighty God, we come to thee, oh God, seeking forgiveness for all our small sins for an, uh, our mortal sin. The question of sin, many Christian connotations come into the translation. There is an entire footnote where when uh, Kunyapatuma's mother prays, she invokes Mayadin, Mayadin. And in, in a footnote, Bashir says, Mayadin is Mohiyuddin Abdul Khadar Jilani. is a Sufi, a holy man died centuries ago, was buried in Baghdad or so. There are many like him. Are they capable of doing miracles? Allah says in Quran, I do not listen to anyone's recommendation. Within Islam, there are questions. And Bashir is not shy of uh, is invoking them. There are footnotes, two or three. But then they are omitted. Now look at this uh, kind of uh, uh, meeting between Kunjupatama and Aisha. You see, I will read what Asher has written. Kunipatama asked, what's your religion? The sari wearing tof said, Muslim, good God, are you like us? Kunipatama asked, no, we are genuine Muslims. Genuine Muslims? She has not heard, uh, she has not had her ears peers for halters. In the lobes of her ears, there are only two gold earrings. What she is wearing is a sari. She has a blouse instead of a kuppayam. Underneath that, she has tight bodies. Now, Muslims in Kerala had their own dress. Again, it is community. Uh, many castes had their caste-specific kind of clothing. You can recognize a Nambudiri, a Brahmin, uh, by his dress, or a Irava by his dress. So Muslims had their specific dress. <clears throat> so in a way, Kunjupatama is right in saying there is this uh, absent. Now, what is the problem with this translation? I have a literal translation. You see, Kunjupatama asks Aisha, I am translating it literally. You what caste? You see, she is not talking about religion. She is saying, Indan Jati. She uses the word jati, not religion. 
Asher makes it religion. And uh, the sari wearing upstart said Muslim. You see, look at the word used by Asher. Uh, sari wearing toff, T-O-F-F. -F. It's a British slang. A toff is a derogatory stereotype for someone with an aristocratic background. You see, it has various associations. The only thing here is power gari. That is what uh, in the original, a kind of show off or this word uh, Asher uses later. So it's an upstart kind of show off. Toff is not justified. And when Aisha says they are Muslims, then Kunjupatama says, Ya Rabul Alameen. Kunjupatama said, like us? Then Aisha replies, no, we are real Islamis. You see, Muslim is not the only word used. We are also Islamis. Islamingal. Real Islamis. Years are, then Kunjupatama thinks, years are not peers, no alikat, only gold flowers on earlobes, dressed in sari and blouse, below that a tight uh, fitting small one. You see, this question of cloth appearance and uh, uh, you see, a whole lot of thing, if Asher had used Ya Rabul Alameen, I am sure a certain intimacy with the original could have been established. My larger argument here is there is a whole lot of uh, orality in the text, which in a way is important because uh, it is this orality which created the larger image of the marginalized Muslim community as uh, maybe less educated. But they have an entire, uh, you see, uh, what you call cultural capital of their own. And this cultural capital is now losing its significance. And when Aisha says her name is Aisha, and then Kunipatama says this is uh, Muhammad Nabi's uh, Veeder's name. Veeder, in Hindi it will be Garwali. He doesn't use the word wife. She doesn't use the word wife. So there are uh, deeply problematic kind of uh, uh, translation, which uh, you see, and then follow the very important part of the novel where Aisha is correcting her every word, how to pronounce this. In a way, she is imposing on her standard Malayalam. And she is in a way converting. This novel is largely about this uh, process of conversion into the standard kind of an identity. Uh, and the, one more small thing, and I will stop. You see, of course, by the, now, Kunjupatama has had an emotional kind of attachment with this Nisar Ahmad. He reciprocates it. And the moment she knows her marriage is going to be decided by her family, she faints, she is ill now. And then uh, they, they bring a Muslim, uh, maybe a priest, who tries to exorcise. Uh, but then finally, their family, Nisar Ahmad's family comes in, they try to save her. And there is a scene where uh, Nisar Hamad's father, Sainuddin, he comes into the house, the room of Kunyupatama, it's all, windows are closed, and he, he I am quoting from the original uh, no, translation, light and air must get into this room, he said. Why have you closed this window? He opened the window. Light and air came in. How bright the light is. This is a a kind of context in Malayalam, how bright the light does not do justification, justice to the original velichatin and the velichan. Throughout, uh, many critics, Eman Karisheri is a major critic who has written on Bashir. He says lifelong association of the idea of light. It has uh, echoes in Sufi poetry, Sufi literature, Bashir was very well read in Sufi literature, and there is uh, many uh, references to light in the novel itself. And uh, you see, even uh, when when he talks about the myth of uh, the origin of earth, etc., 
And th there are many references to light. I will just give one example. Uh, there, is, there is one very powerful sentence. Uh, he, he actually, uh, uh, this is written towards, uh, I will quote the translation. The stars look like glittering dots caught in a huge black spider's web. The original is much more powerful. I will translate it like this. Are the millions of stars, dots of light, ensnared in a colossal black spider web? You see, so light is a major enlightenment. The whole idea of moving into the standard kind of a, a culture. And uh, the, there are references to this question of uh, becoming, I will end by saying what uh, Asher fails to notice is the subtext, which are deeply implicated in Bashir's own critical uh, relation with Malayalam's mainstream uh, literary tradition. And uh, he is also, uh, in a way, he does not align with the social realist novel. Bashir is not conforming to the progressive literature's proclaimed objective of promoting social transformation. In fact, uh, the, the <clears throat> novel is using a orality in a very, uh, it deploys orality as a, a site of cultural kind of negotiation. And uh, this negotiation is the site of meaning, the semantic tension in the novel is in the manner in which the margins negotiate the center. And Bashir transforms it into a contest between two worldviews, two cosmologies. Does he believe Kunyapatama should remain an illiterate and a rural kind of? No. He wants change. He wants transformation. But he wants the mainstream also to become sensitive to the margins. So the novel is saying something larger. There is a larger dialogic space, a third space, as I said. And this is available only if we listen to the intention, the uh, manner in which the uh, intention uh, is realized in the sub transformation of the subtext. I will stop here. I've already taken <clears throat> a few more minutes than allotted to me. Uh, if there are questions, I will clarify and take it forward. Uh, and uh, I had uh, one or two more novels, but uh, let me stop here. Uh, this is adequate to make the larger translation studies in our subcontinent now need to... Uh, translation as a process is fine. We, we need uh, a stage where every translation should be analyzed, interpreted deeply, uh, studied threadbare, uh, not to find fault with the, an academic kind of exercise, maybe, but it will assist the larger purpose of uh, uh, knowing each other, understanding uh, each other, the, the larger uh, idea of uh, comparative studies or translation studies. Thank you. Thank you, Professor E. V. Ramakrishnan, for your excellent uh, presentation. So I'd like to uh, request the audience and I, I can see some you know, questions. So um, in your presentation, you know, just to um, kind of wrap up of the entire talk, I'll try to do this. So you, t you uh, Professor Ramakrishnan actually talked about the need for development of translation studies and also ex highlighted uh, kind of exchanges between Indian languages and other uh, subcontinental languages. And, um, and also noted a disproportion in translation between Malayalam and and Bengali. And then he argues how subtext enter into text and mode of intention must be aware of the subliminal, subliminal voices in the original text so that a third space using Homika Baba's idea can be opened up for reader to consider. And also he talked about how translation is an intimate act of reading. And uh, it is not only intimacy with the text, but uh, preparation is in demand on the part of a translator. It's a kind of social, political, and cultural and semiotic uh, you know, understanding of, uh, of, of, of language and, and largely uh, culture. And also he referred to uh, the novelist Vaikum Muhammad Bashir and uh, Professor Ramakrishnan regrets that lack of 
intimacy in translated work, you know, distorts the original work with reference to childhood friend, a novel, he, st he states how the mainstream Malayalam is not aware of the discourse of the Muslims. With reference to my grandfather had an elephant, he argues how Bashir had a critical relation with mainstream Malayalam. He adds the performativity in Bashir's language, and which is the subtext, which a translator, translator must be aware of. In Vaikum Muhammad Bashir, uh, Professor Ramakrishnan also highlighted the larger vision of life which must be considered in any transla translation project. And Professor Ramakrishnan also exemplifies how the oral tradition as a subtext may get, get ignored in translation. He also talked about how the discourse of a community, the aspects of caste, the cultural nuances, the religious nuances, largely the cultural capital and sometimes philosophical vision of an author may get overlooked in translation. So with this, I think Professor Ramakrishnan has, uh, you know, clearly, you know, uh, presented his thoughts and ideas. Now, I'd like to uh, check whether we received any questions. Uh, let me, and also, Professor Ramakrishnan, you can also see the, you know, the questions. So let me check. If you can read out, it will be oh, helpful. Sure, sure. Let me let me That'd open be... up. Mm. Uh, so. Meanwhile, I think we can open up the question if anyone want to ask. Okay. Because Please raise your hand or just. Uh, um, I can see a question. Okay, can I read it? Um, yeah, please, please. So, a translator who is translating one novel or any content, which is written by the translator himself or herself, and on the other hand, um, another translator who is also translating the novel. So, considering two different cases. Okay. So uh, one novel translated by the novelist himself and another, uh, the same novel if translated by another person, then what will be the differences between these two translated texts, okay? And how translation yes. is important where we know that it is not possible to convey the passion of the original text on the translated text. So is it possible to translate or, you know, the second part of the question is how important is translation uh, where we know that it is not possible to convey the passion of the original text uh, in the translated text. So, Professor Ramakrishnan, your response. Yeah. Thank you for a very good question. In fact, uh, very often we have a kind of uh, misconception that self-translations may be uh, is a ideal in the sense the author uh, who wrote the original has uh, a certain kind of inwardness or clue to uh, what the text means. And uh, we are not concerned with the meaning of the text. That's one of the things Benjamin also says. You say, if, uh, if uh, there are many as, there will be as many, uh, you say, uh, you can read Hamlet in thousands of ways. So intimate reading, uh, I like, it's a translation is a kind of reception. So already uh, when uh, a, a certain kind of reception, I actually wanted to you know, mention Ovi Vijayan. Ovi Vijayan translated Legends of Kasak, that is the English translation of his original text. The original text was written in 1960s when he had lost faith in a certain political ideology following the Stalinist and other and the novel reflected a certain quest for uh, a new kind of, uh, it was a, a heartbreaking novel in Malayalam, mainly because it was not ideologically, uh, you see, indoctrinated. It was a quest, it was an open kind of text. In 90, early 90, uh, Vijayan translated that into English. But by that time, in the 80s, Vijayan had become uh, a disciple of a guru and he had written Guru Sagaram. The, you see, already he, he, it was a different Vijayan who translated the original text. And you have a lot of rewriting. I would have actually discussed it in detail if there was time. Just to give one example, there is a discussion about in the village. It's about a rural village. There is a subculture. That is why I wanted to take it people with uh, very uh, primitive kind of people with their own languages. There is a new school now and they are discussing is the school uh, desirable. And they say there are 
to two opposite camps. Are they right? Both can be right. And then the people, somebody, nobody, no one is mentioned. It comes to a conclusion, truths are many. But in the translation, Vijayan writes, many small truths make a big truth. Now, this is ideologically totally in the opposite direction. Self-translation can be much more unreliable than the translation by, and that's why when you see translations by informed kind of, translation involves interpretation, hermeneutic kind of an engagement with uh, how texts uh, are actually formed. And uh, that process, meaning making pro uh, process, that may be undertaken by a critic from outside. And the very often uh, self-translations do not actually have any uh, validity, any genuine uh, validity beyond the fact that uh, it is just one more translation. Now the second, uh, the question of passion, as we, we are saying, this is an attribute of the text. It's a kind of, uh, you see, discourses uh, can have inflection. It's part of the silence of a text, the passion, what you say, and that's what part of the rhetoricity to the extent it actually is available through the rhetoric features of language, a, a translator can address that uh, idea of passion. Look at the uh, translation of Dostoevsky's uh, novels, uh, or Marquez's novel. Uh, I, I do feel passion is an attribute which you cannot pinpoint. Your idea of passion may differ from my idea of uh, the uh, emotional kind of you know, the state of being. Any other question? Oh, thank I you. hope uh, my answers, uh, answer is adequate. Yes, thank you. Excellent. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Hiran Patel. If you can hear me, you can ask your questions to yeah. Professor Ramakrishnan. Hello, sir. Good evening. It's me, Hiran Patel. Oh, uh, thank you. Sir, while listen uh, uh, while listening to your uh, presentation, I had two things in my mind. One is in this idea of a subtext. Uh, you mentioned the translation by Julius Lepiner of Anand Mutt. Uh, yeah. I was uh, thinking about uh, that, uh, especially in the context of uh, Indian languages or the Indian uh, subcontinent. Uh, is it? Uh, are you make? Are you trying to make the point that uh, while translating certain uh, text, it becomes uh, uh, very much necessary to provide uh, introduction in a way that actually complement the translation. Uh, that's why we can avoid uh, uh, reducing the intention of the uh, uh, author. And at the same time, I was thinking about uh, the, the the work that I recently read by Phanishwarnath Renu Mela Achal. So it becomes uh, very difficult uh, to translate such kind of text into another language, especially if we talk about English. So I was uh, thinking about this idea of subtext, how it gets uh, eliminated when you do not provide extra, say, you talked about interviews and essays and all. So I just wanted to have clarification on that. Uh, thank you, Hiran, for... Uh, in, in fact, uh, Maila Anjal also came out in 1953 or so, around uh, in the early 50s. And these are highly polyphonic, quote-unquote, Bakhtin's term, uh, novels, Bashir's also. So in that sense, the, the polyphony of voices, there are, you see, in uh, Maila Anjal also, there are, uh, you see, this very important question of the uh, remote village and the, the kind of cultural contestations which uh, uh, taking place there. So I very strongly argue that the text as translated in translation uh, kind of uh, 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 is a, uh, context, it has to be supplemented by several other kind of material. We make a mistake when uh, I have seen, you see, uh, recently uh, some uh, foreign, you see, even very famous books, when they are translated, you find a foreword, you find an introduction done by a major critic or a scholar who has studied that area for years. 
maybe 10 pages 12 pages but that can be of uh, uh, it can become a, a point of entry into many questions a, a text is it comes into being in answer to several questions in a uh, society so in a way bashir was writing uh, in answer to questions which began in kerala renaissance in the late 19th century so unless you have a fairly good idea of what happens in the 70s 80 years between the first novel or late uh, 1880 to 1950 you may not really get the uh, very rich uh, subtext of the novel and that is where asher as a linguist maybe he has done a very good job translation has been admired but we as readers or critics we as uh, you say in malayalam or i have written about bashir but then you say i have been critical of some of these issues but we need to create a whole discipline called translation studies unless you see as we go uh, move forward translations will improve translators will become aware of this complexity of the process uh, knowing the language is not enough or adequate i'm not saying they should all actually join uh, mma in history and study the entire i'm not saying that but there should be a sensitivity to the larger issues underlying a, a text so i um, agree with you hiran and uh, uh, this polyphonic character the more and that's where benjamin says uh, you see the text which are more metaphorical they they challenge uh, a translator so the content value uh, may not be information based what a novel actually uh, makes available is uh, a manner of constructing meaning and this uh, i don't know how far i have been able to convey that there are you need to listen to the voices within a uh, social structure thank you for this very important question thank you hiran patel for you, your sir. question and thank you professor ramakrishnan for yes. answering the question now i'd like thank to invite um, pradeep kumar solanki uh, pradeep kumar solanki please um, ask your question unmute yourself first and then ask your question hello hello good evening sir uh, good evening good evening sir hello yeah. sir great pleasure and privilege to hear you sir and pradeep <laughs> from gujarat ah pradeep thank you sir sir yeah. yes sir uh, sir uh, i have translated uh, uh, tirad gujarati play into english under your uh, supervision and guidance yeah, as, as my amphil dissertation yeah. yes sir thank you sir thank you sir yeah. sir uh, uh, i i heard you today mm-hmm. and i felt uh, <clears throat> so much you spoke on the cultural importance in translation yeah. Yeah. because uh, a translation what is the importance of culture in translation yeah. so um, sir i have i have translated the play text and uh, even my this question is uh, also related with the play text because mm-hmm. uh, recently i am translating uh, two gujarati plays uh, mm-hmm. by sitan sushar into english uh, uh, under amit sir as my phd dissertation sir okay. and mm-hmm. sir uh, i i have read the plays uh, very intimately and okay. uh, uh, sir i i i felt that uh, like how a translator can uh, deal with the mm. slang in the text yeah. because sir uh, uh, reading when reading for translation mm. uh, so much of standardization of language takes place yes. because yeah. re- reading slang into standard language yeah and uh, uh, the process then directly proceeds to the translation mm. and uh, while carrying cultural equivalence from source mm. text to the target yeah. text yeah uh, this seems to be a bit a violation with that slang text which which could be the charm of the text sir actually and uh, yes, the standardization yes, when it when it comes to standardization of yes. language sir mm-hmm. so how can a translator uh, uh, see that slang in the text yes. and how can it be carried forward in the translation sir see, he, uh, here i have uh, i have only suggestion as a translator myself i have faced this uh, you see one is uh, the history of standardization itself you you should try to understand and uh, does the for example parsi gujarati could be uh, much more challenging you see yes, than sir. the standard gujarati 
or maybe yes, the dialect of uh, Saurashtra or Kutch or maybe yes, North Gujarat. You see, these are, you see, you cannot bring in uh, an entire slang may not be translatable, but you can bring in the flavor. You see, that's yes, where I mentioned, intro mm. saying, oh, good God, why not say, ya Rabul Alameen, you see, that is one way of bringing a certain tone, a certain uh, way of, it's a gesture, gesturing towards gesture. the mode of intention. So I see, the mode of intention of the original text, you see, needs to be incorporated in your translation. And that mode, yes, you see, to what extent? Is the novel fully written in slang? Then I'm sure nobody would even uh, think of translating it. Definitely, it yes, is sir. because there is standard language and also slang. So slang, what is the function slang is uh, actually? It's characterization sometimes, but sometimes there may be a very important operative word which sums up the nature of that culture itself. You see, yes, that is where you, you, you see, a word may actually mean much, much, uh, you see, more for that community. Or maybe as a woman, that word means much more because uh, there is something in her, you see, childhood which actually, uh, you see, uh, is trapped in that entire, a word may trap an entire uh, past. So these are yes, things which you have to listen. The entire slang cannot be and need not be translated, but yes, there should be, you see. And uh, as I said, maybe if you can have uh, uh, either footnotes or end notes or a very uh, exhaustive kind of, uh, you see, look at uh, A.K. Ramanujan's uh, poetry of love and war. You yes, see, I just want to say, I read uh, the entire poetry and felt very happy. And then yes, I read Ramanujan. And then he says, then he understood he had not understood the poetry. Only when he read Ramanujan's, uh, the, how should you read the poetry of uh, what he called uh, Old Tamil? You see, you need scholarship there. You need an entire apparatus of a, a entire semiotic system developed by Sangha, you see, Sangha uh, period of Tamil uh, culture. So, no one shouldn't be ashamed of displaying a level of uh, you see, scholarship and uh, a whole lot of uh, you see, material need to actually go into the as supplementary. I'm not saying uh, it, it, it should be uh, one. There again, uh, a good translator will know what should actually be you see, uh, ideal, you see. So I am sure. Yes. Uh, you you are, you have understood the argument I have put. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I do understand, sir. Uh, I do thank understand. You. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Welcome. Thanks to both of you. Uh, I think we are approaching the end, and we can take uh, only one or two questions, maybe. So first, I'd like to invite uh, Alka Netrakar. Would you uh, ask your questions? Unmute yourself and ask your questions. Alka, if you are here, if you can hear me, it's your time. Alka, can you hear? Alka Natreka. I don't think she's with us anymore. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. um, next, I'd like to invite Professor Esan Jaman. If you if you can hear me, uh, you can ask your question. Hello. Good evening. Can you hear good me? Good evening. Yeah, I can hear you, Dr. Hamad. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was really wonderful listening to you. Um, you mentioned you referred to Benjamin and also referred to invisibility of translation, etc. Uh, yeah. You know, as for Benjamin, uh, one cannot uh, one cannot reproduce the original. It's not possible. So what one can strive to do is kind of uh, produce or uh, attempt to produce the echo of the original, the yeah. echo of the original, and also. Yeah. He says that one can try to capture the inten intention, intention of the original author. My question is that whether Muhammad Bashir could do it in his translation, and for that matter, is it really possible to to produce or reproduce the intention of the original author? 
uh, you see here what i was trying to say is that it's not the intention of the original but the mode of intention you see what is the mode of intention there is a di distinction between the intended uh, object and the manner in which that intention is realized so uh, and that's where benjamin actually says very often we we uh, as translators uh, make a mistake of misreading the mode of intention now two two things about bashir's uh, text you see how uh, why there is a certain uh, you see uh, rich very very you see rich uh, cultural kind of details in the you see sections dealing with uh, this girls uh, this young woman kunju patuma's uh, you see family the the in a way they are impoverished they are extremely uh, destitute but there is a certain enchanted world bashir makes bashir is a writer who you cannot take one word away from him and that is why i am uh, saying when asher the paraphrases or does not translate certain sentences these are not big novels these are only you see 100 120 pages and may, maybe less than that so bashi writes and revises and he is a very hard kind of uh, is a writer who, who knows what each word actually signifies so in such a writer the mode of intention you see where an image comes now the he would never use you see uh, he gives a long list of local muslim names look at the reverberation you see when you say fatima fatima is a pan indian kind of muslim name patuma is a malayalam version of fatima kunju patuma endearingly called she is small fatima or small patuma look at in the same there, there is a, a, a number of names he quotes at one so the semiotic resonance of uh, naming bashir is naming a community which had no name no local habitation and name as words were put it so he is creating a, a space where the other you see muslim had become the other muslim had become the nameless uh subjugated other so dialect in fact uh, some people argue a dialect is a defeated language you see among many dialect one dialect becomes standard language imagine muslim dialect becomes standard malayalam language then fatima or kunju patuma would actually be her voice would become authentic and powerful but this powerlessness loss of agency this is in the linguistic kind of a contest every language has a, a cultural kind of domain where contestation between dialect and this reflect the larger social and uh, political kind of power you the uh, contest so we need to be sensitive of this so one dialect in a way has a cosmology it has a world view it looks at the world through a window through a frame that frame becomes the intention of the mode of intending you see uh, and that's why when we find descriptions of kunju patuma talking to uh, small birds talking to a tree talking to a leech which is sucking blood from her body you see for her this where does this in, uh, awareness comes that the living world is partly i i would say bashir is it's part of mode of intention of bashir this is what enlightened modernity has stolen away from us it has not only stolen the enchanted idea of the world it has also taken us it has created a, a anthropomorphic human centered world where everything has become the other power operates through the process of othering so bashir as 
a, a visionary, I would say, as a, a, and that is where every word has to be listened to. In writers like uh, Bashir, whose philosophical sense of reality uh, is embodied in the choice of words. So uh, I understand the, the question. I don't know how far I have answered it. Hope uh, you, you agree with me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this was the last question, actually, for time restriction. We cannot take any more questions. Yeah, Sorry, I but uh, the you know the recorded video um, will be uploaded on YouTube channel on our YouTube channel. Uh, you should uh, probably Thank know you. that. Anyway, so with this, I would like to end this session, and I would like to invite once again Professor Master Shahid Hussain um, for next 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 of the actually time the rest of the time we have, rest of the time we have. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mashru. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this takes us to the end of our session. And I would like to thank uh, Professor E.V. Ramakrishnan uh, for this excellent and touch-provoking presentation. Thank you, sir, for this. I would also like to thank the department, uh, the chair of the department, Dr. Mahanim Sharif, uh, for moderating the session, Kazi Ashrafuddin, uh, for being the host uh, of Zoom, uh, Sharia Rashapuntu for designing the flyer. And of course, I would like to thank the audience, the participants, the listener, and people who made a meaningful intervention in, the, in this exciting talk. And it is the intervention, the vibrant intervention, that made this talk a more meaningful, more useful. And again, thank you, everyone. In the next week, I mean, uh, it will be on Saturday. Uh, that we will have our next webinar, and that will be on uh, emergency remote teaching. That is the problem and issues of panopticism uh, when we are doing activities online or giving and taking class online. And that will be offered by a professor of Bangladesh. Until then, let us stay safe and sane. Let's reach each other. Let's enrich each other. Thank you, everyone.